welcome to the REA British Kilbit Sailing How to Match Race. My name is Kate McGregor, I'm three times match racing world champion and a London 2012 Olympian in the match racing discipline. Um, I'm going to be going through um, a, a few sessions on match racing and we're, each session will focus on a different area. Tonight we will be covering the introduction to match racing sessions and what each week will entail. What is mat racing? The course. How the start is different to fleet racing. And any questions that you have, please feel free to put them in the comments box below and I will get back to you as soon as possible. So this slide shows the different sessions that we'll be running. Um, as you can see, we've broken it down. So each week we'll focus on a different area of the mat racing course. Um, what's important to highlight is that we won't be able to cover everything during this time, but it will give you a little insight into what mat racing is about. And if you've never mat raced before, these sessions will be perfect for you. So, let's get to it. What is mat racing? So, mat racing is raced in two identical boats. Um, usually, the uh, host club will provide the boats, so you don't need to turn up with your own boat, which makes costs a lot uh, easier and logistics a lot easier as well. Short courses and short races. So the races are only about 18 to 20 minutes long, which means that you'll end up having multiple races, a lot more than what you would have in say a fleet race. You have on the water umpires. So although a lot of the Fleet racing has gone towards more jury on the water and on the water decisions. Um, you always have on the water umpires. Um, this means that you don't have to take voluntary turns. Uh, you have the option to, but generally you wouldn't. And you look to the umpires to make that cool. We'll go into more details of how they do this in the next few slides. The usual format for an event, whether it's two days, five days, no matter what it is, is a, a round robin. Um, sometimes if you've got a longer event, you might try and do a double round robin. Quarterfinals, semifinals and finals. The unfortunate bit about match racing is a lot of the time it involves weigh-ins. Uh, usually if you're a, a female team um, rocking up at a uh, open event, you may find that you might be able to carry one more person just because the females tend to be a little bit smaller. Um, and likewise, you may find that some um, all male boats will sail four up and some will sail five up. So these weigh-ins really give you those options of working out what the best combination of crew is within whatever boat you are sailing. Differences to fleet racing are quite huge, but at the end of the day, you need to remember, and I'm gonna keep saying this, is that it is just a sailboat race. You're still trying to get around the course as fast as possible. Often when people start sailing, uh, um, mat racing in particular, they overcomplicate it when actually if they just sail the boat really well around the course, that's gonna get them uh, to the front. So let's move on to the course. What I'm gonna show you is a, a little, diagram here. So it's a simple windward lured. This bit looks quite easy. So usually you have a two lap race, windward lured. One thing you may not have noticed is that they are passing the marks or the windward mark at least to starboard. Um, often at the lured marks it is a gate, however you may find that it's not. If it's just one lured mark it is just a rounding to starboard as it is up at the top mark. So fairly simple and not too different to a normal fleet race. One area of mat racing that is very different to fleet racing is the start. So unlike fleet racing, where you've got, say, the first two to three minutes is quite chilled, you're doing all of your checks, that needs to have already happened in a mat race at five minutes to go. So I'm gonna take you through the start sequence first, and then I'm gonna explain what this means in practice. So the start sequence, 
What you'll see is a F flag, which is this white flag with the red diamond in the middle. This will go up at seven minutes if you are the first start. So what you will see is that you this, each start is numbered with a numeral pennant, one, two, three, or four. Um, and what you will find, that's why I've put the seven, 12, and 17 in brackets, because it depends on which start you are. So let's take the first start into consideration. So F flag goes up at seven minutes. At six minutes, the F flag comes down. And this gives you two minutes to your entry. So what we mean by that is you enter into the starting box. Again, we'll go into that on the next slide. At five minutes, you see the numeral pennant going up. This is really your last time to check you've got the right time to the second, um, ready for when you're going to enter and engage with the other boat. At four minutes, you see the P flag. So for all you fleet racers out there, this is gonna seem pretty familiar um, and similar to fleet racing. What you will find is that you there's more emphasis on this four minutes, especially if you are the poor entry boat, which like I said, I will explain in the next slide. Here we have two minutes. So this is only a signal that is explain and um, it's sounded if you haven't entered the starting area. So nothing should happen at two minutes because hopefully both boats have entered and they're jostling for the right place and the perfect start. At one minute, you will see the P flag come down. So same as fleet racing. And then at go, you will see the numeral pennant one, which is this white flag with the red dot. You'll see that come down. And if there's another match afterwards, you will see numeral pennant two go up at the same time. So this might be a good time to take some notes if you haven't um, been match racing before, just because there are, it looks pretty similar to a fleet race, but there's obviously the slight subtle changes. As we mentioned earlier, you enter the starting area at four minutes. So what does this mean? This means that you have a boat at each end of the starting line. So you have the blue boat at the pin end, as shown in this diagram, and the yellow boat at the starboard end. Um, these colors are defined by usually a flag, which is either on your back stay, or it may be a Velcro um, tab on your sail, uh, so it's important that you know which end of the line you are, but also that you have the right coloured flags on. The umpires will come up and give you a nudge if it is wrong, especially if you're new to it. Um, but this is a key point just to take into your first match racing event. So as you can see here, I'm going to take you through a little diagram. So the boats cross the perpendicular line. And then they need to cross the actual starting line, which in this case is between the committee boat and the pin end. So they cross down beneath. You may remember before I said there would be a sound signal at two minutes. This is if they don't cross this start line. So as you can see here, they have both crossed. So there should be no signals or flags going up at two minutes. As you would expect, the port hand boat at the pin end has a bit of a disadvantage on the starboard hand boat. So what we will see is that the boat, the pin end boat will start to come up and tack round. At this point, it's really important to make sure that as the port boat, you complete your tack. As the starboard boat, you want to try and hunt them but remember rule 16, which means that if you alter the course whilst you're engaging with another boat, you, will, um, you won't get a penalty against them. They will, they're okay to do that. If you are altering course the whole time, they've got no way out. So we'll keep watching this video through. So as you can see, the port boat is tacking, and the starboard boat comes up and happy days. What we then call, if you go up head to wind, this is what we call a dial-up. 
So the boats may be here for quite a long time. The slower the boat and the longer the boat, um, the harder it is to get out of this dial up. Uh, something like an Elliot, where it's quite dinghy-like, it's quite easy to get out of this situation. Um, there is definitely positions fore and aft, which are, will help you as in each of these positions. We will go into that when we do um, a focus fully on the pre-start. And we just have to remember that this is just an introduction of how you enter and start the race. So we just mentioned the dial-up. As you can see on the diagram there, we've got the explanation of the dial-up. So that's two boats entering at four minutes, engaging and then ending up head to end. What you'll find, this will happen when you've got a fairly square line. Um, so either the pin boat can't cross or above or beneath. So they're just going into the dial-up. And in some boats, as I mentioned, you can be there for the full three minutes or four minutes and get really stuck. So positioning is very important at this point. We then have uh, the option of crossing low as the pin boat, which is the blue boat. So as you see in this diagram, the blue boat is able to cross low because we have a starboard bias line. You can usually tell that this is gonna happen before the start. And I think it's really important that you plan as if you would a fleet race of how you're going to start the position where along the line, but also the little details, which are actually a major factor, um, is whether you're going to be going into a dial up, crossing low, or the next one, which is crossing high. And here you can see that the blue boat has entered the line, gone beneath the start line, come up, and is crossing the starboard boat very easily. This is quite a risky move if you've got a tight cross. Um, if you've got a tight cross, what you'd be better doing is by entering and then uh, continuing along the line a little bit more and then entering into a dial-up so that you're more towards the starboard end of the line. The reason you want to be towards the starboard end of the line is because that is the place that's safer to be. So if we look at this diagram here, what you can see is the different no-go zone areas and the happy places. So I mentioned about having a plan before the pre-start uh, starts and before the four minutes. And what you'll be doing during this time is working out the line bias uh, and the ley lines. So if we look at this green box, you can see that there's some, uh, some parallel lines on it. These refer to the ley lines that you would be getting in practical terms. So here, the green area is the safe place to be. If you go into the yellow area, that's usually what we call the playground. That's where all of the, the spinning and the um, maneuvering happens. And usually everyone gets pretty tired at this point. <laughs> you don't just spin for the sake of it. You are trying to get into that position to get your best start. However, I just, I won't go into too much detail on that. We will just focus on these bad areas. As you can see on the left hand side of the screen, we have got the red zone. If you end up over there, which can happen if you're the blue boat and think that you've got a cross or that you haven't engaged in the dial up or whatever it is, you can end up down there and that is almost game over. That's because you end up being controlled by the other boat. So really important to stay out of the red zone. The orange zones, likewise to the red, not as bad, hence the colors, but obviously it's not a great place to be. I mentioned earlier that there are on the water umpires. If a protest happens, we have why flag is displayed. At this point, the umpire decision will be a yes or a no. If it is a yes, it will be those blue or yellow flags that we mentioned before. So if it's a blue flag that goes up and stays up, that is a penalty on blue and vice versa if it was a yellow flag. If it's a no, which hopefully it wouldn't be, it would be a green flag. This is often green and white. Sometimes it's all green, but more often than not, it's green and white. If 
we have a penalty and an advantage is gained. So an example of this may be if somebody barges in at the mark, they get a penalty and then they get another penalty because they've gained an advantage. So in this case, it would be a blue flag or what you may find is a red flag. What happens is if the um, penalty needs to be taken straight away, you'd get a red flag. If it's a, a different advantage, and this, which flag the umpires use will be dependent on which rule is broken, but also how much of a gain has been made out of the situation and the rule breaking. So if it's a red flag with the colour, that means that they have to take the penalty straight away. If they don't, or if you have two flags up, which in this case is blue, is a black flag, which is game over. What you see is you don't see many of this. So if you've watched YouTube clips of the World Match Race Tour or America's Cup, you rarely see a black flag. <laughs> it's not, it doesn't really happen very often. However, I think when people are starting match racing, it can happen. And actually, um, it's important to know this penalty system because you don't want to get caught out by having two penalties and then getting a black flag because you haven't taken it straight away. This side is really important if you are new to mat tracing. So we've talked about how you give a penalty away using the Y flag, which is the yellow and red flag. And then we have explained about how the umpires give the penalties using the either green for no penalty or the blue and yellow flag for a penalty. But what do you actually have to do if you get a penalty? So on a windward leg of the course, you jibe round and it's really important that you luff back up to close hold. Um, this is quite a good option if you've got a bit of a lead um, and you can still stay ahead of that other boat. When going on a downwind course, what you will need to do is tack round. And this is really important. There's a few different areas here. Um, one being you need to make sure that you have turned down more than 90 degrees from the wind before the, the penalty can come off. What another thing you need to be able to do is that the head of the spinnaker needs to be beneath the gooseneck. So where the fitting is for the boom to the mast, the head of the spinnaker has to be beneath that point. If it's not, or even if it's a tiny bit above and the umpires notice, the penalty still stands and you haven't been able to get rid of that penalty. Another one is um, the more exciting one, if you like, is offsetting your penalty on the other boat. So that could be by slowing down, by trying to luff them. There's multiple options here, which we will look into in a later session. It's quite hard work. It's very tactical, trying to slow boats down. You may be going downwind with your main in and the kite down. Um, so it's quite an exciting moment. And when you do it in your first match race, it will be a bit of a moment where you have to look back on it to see what actually happened because everything happens quite quickly. So if you're going to your first match racing event, I have a few top tips for you. Don't go to the event with the aim of getting penalties on the other boat. If you do this, what you'll find is you'll end up in a complete mess and it's just not worth it. You'll probably end up further behind than you needed to be. Uh, really important to try and sail the boat fast. Win the start. It makes the rest of the race a lot easier. And that sounds really simple, but I think people think match racing, that they've got to attack the other boat the whole time. It's, uh, it's important that you keep the mentality of um, fleet racing, where you're trying to sail fast, you're trying to win the start. You've got to start at the bias end, um, and then hopefully it will be easy. Don't lose track pre-start. So what I mean by this is if the wind is shifting around a lot, you need to have somebody out with their head outside of the boat. What you'll find in the pre-start when you're new is that everyone is uh, head in the boat and focused on the other boat and it's really hard, which leads me on to define your roles. 
So one thing that doesn't change in match racing is your team. Your team stays the same throughout the event. So make sure that although you might be sailing slightly different boats, which fingers crossed they're all set up the same, have the same roles before you even step into that boat. Slick boat handling will help. And again, this is easier said than done, but any practice that you get, you usually get uh, practice sessions um, for most events that you go to. You normally get a two hour time slot the day before. Make the most of these sessions because they're invaluable. And if you'll be kicking yourself if you don't manage to get round to it. I've said it before, but it's just another sailing race. Don't overcomplicate it. Plan ahead and always think about the next move. So this goes back to the roles in your boat. Those people looking upwind, looking downwind, looking at the next leg, really key people and communication to feed back to the helmsman. So we talked about having the Y, the y flag for the protests. Um, really important that you have this in your boat. If not, it might be quite a tricky race. Um, but also where you can have two. Um, so any match racing thing that I've done before, the helmsman's always had one and then as either tactician or bow, I will have a second one. And then the final but most important one is sail fast. Make sure that you are sailing fast all times. It's, uh, I keep saying it, but it's just another boat race where you need to get around the course as quick as possible. Next time. We will be debriefing the Youth and Women's Nationals. Um, so please get in touch if you have any specific scenarios. And thank you all for listening and I look forward to seeing you all then.